here to lovely. Okay, thanks for joining me again. Um, we're talking about music. That's uh, that was the topic last week, and it continues to be the topic this week. Uh, but not simply music, um, as it comes to um, uh, relaxation uh, and quiet listening, but the music in the base Amigdash. Now we know that there was music as part of the ceremonials in the base Amigdash, and um, uh, this was just specifically at the time of various korbanos and major events. So originally we came into it, um, introduced to this musical accompaniment for the purposes of the Simchat Beis HaShoeva on the Sukkot, when they libated the water and there were great celebrations uh, and a lot of Simcha uh, and informality that uh, accompanied the formal event of the libation. And there was song, there was instrumentation, and there was also the playing of flutes. That was one of the instruments. Now, the flute isn't, if you like, a statutory um, Beis HaMikdosh uh, instrument, but it was an addition. And the, the Mishnah had told us, this is where we got into the music, that the flutes were not operational on a Shabbat or on the Yom Tov itself, but only on like on the Chola Moed, and only if it wasn't Shabbat. Otherwise, the ceremony would consist of singing, vocal singing, and perhaps it seems possibly um, some of the more statutory instruments. But let's assume it was just the, um, the vocal singing, because the Simchas Beis HaShoeva um, was not a, if you like, a, an avoda proper, it was something a little bit lower than the, the, the normal avoda of Korbanot. And the uh, commentaries tell us, and we'll see this later on as well, that the need for music and the flautist accompaniments was not a statutory need. And therefore, because it wasn't a real statutory need, you could make merry on the Simchas Beis HaShoeva without instrumentation. Um, it was not allowed to be used on a Shabbat or a Yom Tov. We would only allow it to be used if it was a necessary part of the Avodah. But on uh, Chol uh, and and um, uh, this, this ceremony of the Simchas Beis HaShoeva didn't require formally the use of these instruments. And because there was always a risk of an instrument breaking down or someone needing some sort of guidance on how to use instruments, Chazal generally said one shouldn't play instruments on a Shabbat or Yom Tov. So therefore, that ban was in place even in the Beis HaMikdash when it came to the Simchat Beit HaShoeva. Where we got into the Gemara, which we did start last week, was to talk more generally about its use even for the formal Korbanot, the use of those instruments for um, the Korban Toda, for example. There were times when the music of the Levim and of the instruments was something very much more formal. It, it was um, to accompany the Korban Tomid. And there uh, we, we, we quoted various uh, psukim, which suggested that it needed to be an avoda. The avoda here means the service, if you like, the uh, uh, the mincha, the uh, korban toda service, the toda oh. korban brought twice a day. Um, that avoda needed to be done for simcha. And what simcha ain't simcha le bashir. One can't generate the uh, atmosphere of simcha without song, or at least without music. And that's why there was a formal need for accompaniment at the korban toda ceremony. Over here, we're going to bring a uh, locus in the Bryce. I'm going to start you off on 50B, Nun Ahmed Beit. I think it's about seven lines down if you're following uh, from the Gemara, from the sheet, which I, uh, I sent out. And the last uh, word on the line, I think it's the seventh line, is an abbreviation, <laughs> top ration, unless you've got Tanur Abanan. But that's what the abbre abbreviation is. This introduces a Bryce. And the price uh, starts the next line. Hechalil, <coughs> I haven't actually muted. Everyone's so quiet here. I don't even need to mute. Such good behavior in the classroom is absolutely uh, tremendous. So Tonara Bonon, our rabbis taught Hechalil, the flute, Doche et HaShabbat, and is Doche Shabbos, Divi Rabbi Yosi by Yehuda. Now that is the opinion the first opinion of Rabbi Yossi Bayhuda, who says that when it comes to the Korban Torah, as we'll see, the Gemara will explain, um, you, could, you could play the flute to accompany the um, Korbanos of Shabbat. 
even though normally the flute wasn't an instrument which was required, um, but uh, on, on, on the korban toda specifically, uh, we consider it to be formally necessary and the cholo was allowed. And it's docha Shabbat, which means even on a Shabbat, it was possible. And we're not talking about Sukkot, we're talking about every Shabbat of the year when there is a korban toda, it's a daily offering. Um, that uh, those flutes were allowed to be blown. Doch as a Shabbat means it, uh, it pushes away the normal restrictions of Shabbat and you may blow the flute. Divri Rabbi Yossi Bayhud, but that's just Rosi Bayhud's opinion. The Chachamim Omrim, the Chachamim argue, and they say, Af Yom Docha. It's not Docha Shabbos and it's not even Docha Yom Tov. Yom Tov is usually considered to be a little bit less. Uh, extreme. It's not do docha yontav or Shabbos, which means you cannot blow with a flute on Shabbos or on yontav. It isn't formally necessary, and therefore we don't allow it. So this is the basic machlopis between the Chachamim and Rabbi Yosi by Yehuda. The first opinion says it is docha Shabbos, you may use the flute on a Shabbat, and the second opinion, Rabbi Yosi by Yehuda, says the Chachamim say that it cannot be used on a Shabbat or yontav at all, you can have shira without it, but that sh the shira must not con include the mecholil. What is the basis of this mat locus? And uh, what underlies the difference between the Chachamim and Rabbi Yosef by Yehuda? So we, we briefly got into this last week. Omar Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef says um, to explain the um, underlying difference between um, Rabbi Yosef by Yehuda and the Chachamim, because they didn't just come up with an opinion you, you can use it or you can't use it without any substantive uh, principle underlying it. So there is a principle underlying both opinions. A machlokus of Bashir shall carbon. First of all, he says, the machlokus is only on the shear, the music that accompanies the real avoda in the base and bigish, the carbon. As the Bryce is going to say later on, Simchas Beis Ha'Shoeva is not part of this machlokas. Everyone will agree that you cannot use the flute on a Shabbos or a Yontav during the Simchas Beis Ha'Shoeva ceremony. That is not considered to be a, a ceremony that really requires music to the extent that we will allow the risk of um, the float flute being used. However, when it comes to the Korban Toda, which is a more formal of Oda, that's when there is this machlokas and you have the opinion of the Chachamim saying that you can use it. Why do they say you can use it for the Torah ceremony? And Rabbi Yosef Ayyuda says, you may not. So he explains, to Rabbi Yosef Sava, Ikashira Bichli, the Avodahi, the Doches HaShabbos, because Rabbi Yosef holds that the um, fundamental requirement of Shira, which is a requirement, we said, Minha Torah for the Toda is actually instrumental. And therefore, it is a necessary part of the avoda. And like any other avoda, which is required on Shabbos, it's doch as a Shabbos, as we said. I mean, the whole, everything in, that is done in the Beis HaMikdosh uh, on a Shabbos is part of the avoda. Normally, we would say is Mechal al Shabbos. But it's allowed because of the avoda. So for example, um, the, the very shechita of the carbon, shechita is not allowed on Shabbos. And yet they shecht on Shabbos for the purposes of the Avodah, for the Karbonot. That's fine, it pushes away Shabbos. And by the same token, says uh, Rabbi Yossi, uh, he says that the blowing of the flute is a necessary element, formally and halachically necessarily, sorry, to accompany the Karbon Toda. And therefore it is also Doche Shabbos, no problem about it being used on Shabbos, because the flute and the instruments in general are required on Shabbos. However, the other opinion, Rabbon on Sovri, the Chachamim hold, no, Ika Shira Befer. The fundamental requirement of Shira for a carbon is not instrumentation, it is singing, it is the voices of the Levian, the chorus, the choral part. The instrumentation that was, uh, which was uh, often accompanying the singing, adds to enhance the quality of the sound. But it isn't necessary in itself. If there were no instruments, you would carry on with a Levium singing. The Ikra is Levium. So it would turn out that, as the Bryce continues, the lava vodahi, and therefore the use of flutes or instrumentation it, uh, to accompany the Toda service is only it's not an avoda. It's not consistent, uh, doesn't 
constitute a formal um, temple avoda because it's not formally required. It's just an appendage, something to make it nicer. It's a hidu mitzvah, but it's not actually the mitzvah. And if that's the case, that only the singing is the mitzvah, this is how you hold. But the the, the uh, instrumentation that accompanies it is really only to enhance the feeling and the atmosphere. It's not going to push away Shabbos. We don't push away Shabbos for stuff which is only ornament to the Avoda. And according to this opinion, the Avoda is really the singing. But when it comes to Simcha, as we said, Simcha, he. The When it comes to the Simchas Beisai Shoeva, which is how we got into this in the first place a few weeks ago, um, that is simply required to, 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 for merriment. And all the instrumentation, all the singing is merriment. It's not formally part of the Avoda. No one will hold, neither the Rabbana nor Rabbi Yosu will hold, but you, that, that can happen on Shabbos. So we're focusing really now on the other days not Simcha's Beis Oisho, but where there is this Machlokas, and just to, to, to um, emphasize it again, according to the way Rabbi Yosef is explaining it, the difference between the Chachomim and Rabbi Yosef Ayhuda, whether the flute can be used on a Shabbos as part of the Korban Toda ceremony, is based upon a fundamental disagreement between the two as to what element constitutes the main requirement of Shira. Shira is required. In other words, music is required. But what does music mean? What did the Torah intend you to do? If you say the Ika Shira Befer, that means it, the Torah really formalized the need for vocal singing. Now, everything you bring along, you want to bring your harps and your lyres and, and your flutes and everything else along, that's uh, an enhancement, but it's not the formal requirement, and therefore it's not an avoda, and therefore it can't be done on Shabbos. If you hold that the formal, formal requirement is not the singing, what was intended was really the instrumentation, in a sense the singing is just an accompaniment, then you will hold uh, necessarily um, that it is a formal avoda to use these instruments like the flute, and therefore it can be used on shabbos. Just to remind you again, the Rabbonin and Rabbi Yosef Bayhuri didn't give their reason. They just, one just said, you can use it on shabbos, and the other one said, you can't. It was Rabbi Yosef, who underlines this machlokas with these two different principles, the principle of whether, uh, the, or the, the question of the principle, whether Ikashira is Befer or Ikashira is, um, is, is the, the cliche, is, is by instrumentation, right? This Rabbi Yosef is actually in, interpreting the machlokas on whether you can use it or not on Shabbos to be based upon that difference between the, um, Rabbi Yosef by Yehuda and the Chachamim. Just to um, brighten up the day for you a little bit, I'm just going to sh share a screen. Well, yeah, I, I, you can see my screen, I think, now. One second. Some annoying little things here. Uh, this is from the, um, the Temple Institutes, one of their magnificent pictures. Here you see the, the Heichal, in, deep inside is the Kurdish Agadoshim. This is the main dramatic sanctuary within the center of a courtyard of the base of Medrash. The courtyard is all around. And over here everywhere, let me try and make it even bigger. One second. You can see lots of Kohanim. Here's the Mizbeach, very traumatic, lots of smoke. This is the Korban Do Toda ceremony, says the Temple Institute. They obviously got this photograph and from, from an old album somewhere. And uh, these are Kohanim. And, you know, these on their white garments, aren't they looking happy and merry? Now, on the side here, you can see ranks. There's actually a bomber, like a platform or stairs leading up to a platform. And here are the Levim, and the Levim are singing. And at the top, you can see what seem like trumpeters. Or uh, they could be trumpeters, they could be another row of flautists. So this would be the sort of picture which the Gomorrah is summoning up for us of the... Um, of the uh, uh, daily toda offering in which was accompanied by song and by trumpeters and, uh, and, and flautists. And the question over here really is, on a Shabbat, would you have seen the flautists up here? Or maybe you wouldn't have seen them there. That depends upon how you hold between these two different opinions. If it's really an avodah, because ikashir bakli, 
then you would have seen them there on a Shabbat as well, when a Korban Torah was offered. Uh, if we hold like the other opinion, there would have been the singers and perhaps not the instrumentalists. Just stop sharing. Lovely. Okay. What I want to do now is actually skip quite a large section of the next Gemara until almost the last two words on this same page, Amara Papa, right at the bottom of this page. And then we're going to go over to the next page, which is Nun Aleph Aleph. And I'm doing this because the, what comes next is a very, very detailed and technical argument over how you interpret certain verses, which contain elements of Shira. And they will include really quite complicated discussions, which don't actually come into any halachalamaisa at all, but rather underline different ways of learning, whether you learn riboy uh, miot for riboy, whether you learn klal or prat or klal, the shlosh esrei midas. And I don't think it's really so pertinent for us. It would take us about two long sessions, and, uh, and, and I think it would bore you. So we're going to move to what is, I think, a natural position to take up which is right at the bottom of this page, um, where we'll start. It's the last three words of this page. Amar Rav Papa. Rav Papa said, for those of you who weren't here, by the way, when I started, I'm only going to give a share for about another 10 or 12 minutes because um, I can only make this a short share today because we're going away. Um, but I didn't want to lose the opportunity um, to, to be with you again. <clears throat> so Amar Rav Papa. Rav Papa says, he says, Kitanoi. We turn over now to Nun Allah from Allah 51a. This whole question of whether Ikashira the pair or Ikashira the cliche, cliche is the fundamental requirement of music in the base of English based upon vocalization, vocal, choirs, or is it based upon musical instruments, can be seen reflected in another Brysa we're now going to bring. But we're sort of hunting for other vestiges of this Mach locus somewhere, uh, or where we can say, hey, yes, this is part of the same argument. Is the main foundation of music uh, vocal, or is, it, um, or is it quorum? As I said, this is nothing to do with personal choice. This is to do with the way in which Chazal want to interpret the requirement for musical accompaniment in the Beis Amigdosh. It might be that some people prefer choral music to instrumental music, but that's that's apart from point that this is not the basis of what uh, uh, um, divides Rabbi Yossi by Yehuda from, from the Chachamim, that one preferred music of one kind and one another. This, this is something which is totally impersonal and it's based upon the way Hazal interpreted the, um, the meaning of the Torah. So let's have a look and see what this Bricer is. It's very interesting um, because it doesn't talk directly about whether the music should be uh, vocal or whether it needs to, it should be instrumental, but it's something that you can infer from the opinions which are stated. And there are going to be three opinions stated in this Brysa. And the Brysa deals with um, establishing the identity of the instrumentalists at the time of the carbon tomid. Yeah, now, well, who were they? Now we know who sang, that was the Levium, that's very definite. The Levium Bashir, that was one of the, she that, that, that was their Shevut, that was their service in the base. I mean, they had other functions as well, but one of their main services was song, uh, the choir, if you like, or the Levium. But what about the instrumentalists? Do we just presume that the Levium were also the ones blowing the trumpets, playing the harps, playing the flutes? Do we presume that or is it not? quite as simple as that. Well, this Bryce is going to muddy the waters deeply as to who were the instrumentalists at the time of the ceremony. You know, the identity of those people we saw at the top were their trumpets, who were they? Second, I'm not sure that you're seeing something. Oh, boy. I am being interrupted by a scanning process. Okay, fine. So let's see what the Brysa said. This is either a mission or a Brysa, depending upon how you work the, uh, um, the wording here, Kitanai or Detanya in the, uh, on the top line of Nun Allah Fomad Allah. The instrumentalists at the time of the Korban Tomid, so according to one opinion, Avde Kohanim are you? They were the servants or the slaves of the Kohanim. Oh, that, that, that's a shame, isn't it? So the Kohanim themselves, many of them, 
would have had uh, people who looked after their households. It could have been their cleaners, it could have been their butlers, their uh, batmen, their uh, you know electricians or whatever it is. So they had these people working for them and they were of the Kohanim. And the Kohanim generally quite wealthy and that's quite another matter during the time of the second base I think where they got their money from. Uh, there's all sorts of stories of corruption, etc. But generally speaking, they were quite well to do. And they lived around the base I mean, gosh, as you've seen, the Rovar going up, the Herodian quarter, etc. Big areas there where the Kohanim used to have their Villot. Yeah, like Villot Wolfson. But the, there were the Villot then, for the Beis Hamikdash. And it was those of volume who were allowed to be and primarily were trained in the music and they were very good musicians. So it could be the Kohanim would have employed a volume who already had their um, musical qualifications from the consistoire in Paris or whatever it is, employed these people and they would then be also members of the orchestra in the Beis Hamikdash. That's opinion number one, Dibri Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir says that this is who they were, the Avde Kohanim. Interesting thought. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Yossi says, Mishpachas beis habagorim, or Mishpachas beis tzipuraya, or me emos hayu. Very interesting. He says they were not the Avde Kohanim. They were members of specific families who, uh, the Rashi explains, were very meyuchasim. They had good yichas. They had good pedigree, good standing. There was no doubt about their uh, um, their ancestors, that there were no mamzerim and no do doubtful people and etc. They were all really from the creme de la creme, right? They could all trace their ancestry back to Rashi. So these people were the um, uh, musicians, but they were Israelim. They were not Levium, but they were meyuchos. Interesting, it says, emos for you. Emmaus, you know, which appears a lot in the New Testament as well, um, it's thought to be somewhere like Kiryat Anavim or Mozart. There's, it's not exactly sure where they, it is, but it was a fine, noble area on the Kfish Echad somewhere, as it would be today, not so far away from Yerushalayim, Emmaus. And in that town, there were some very fine and nobility families, and they were the musicians, not Levium but not Avodim either. They were a little bit, you know, slightly better pedigree than Avde Kohanim. They were the musicians. Shehoyu Masiyin Lekahuda. They were so noble that they managed to even marry their, um, their daughters and et cetera over to Kohanim, you know, because Kohanim were very specific. We're not talking here about, the, about marrying divorcees or anything necessarily like that, but even the um, nature of the families, you know, if you're, a, if you're born in royalty, then, uh, you know, your royalty is gonna shun, you know, a woman out there, you know, like a Lady Diana wasn't easily accepted, oh, and as Megan isn't either really, into the British royal family. So the Kohanim wanted to have noble women, and these were so noble, even though they were from Israeli families, they used to marry into them. This is just a way of expressing the extent of their yichus. And but Rabbi Hanina ben Antignus Omer, he says, Levim, are you? They were Levites, they were Levim. So we just quickly share screen with you. There are three opinions. If you like, there are, um, there's a hierarchy over here, and I've written it this way. Who can be a flautist? Actually, maybe I should have written it, who can be a, a musician? It's Lao Dafka, just um, uh, the flutes. Who can be a, music a musician? Says Rabbi Meir, it, it actually was, uh, the, the, the roles were taken up even by Avodim, non-Jewish slaves, I said. In other words, the slaves themselves were non-Jewish, but they belonged to the Kohanim, and they came down, when, they, when the Kohen came down to do his avodah, he had behind him his flautist, and then the flautist stood on one of those balconies, and he played the music. That's Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yossi says, I've written here, distinguished Yisraelim. And Rabbi Hanina says, only the Levium. So that's the order. I mean, the, 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 if you like, the one that requires the highest, most noble qualities, Rabbi Hanina, he says, only a lady. The lady can sing, the lady has to play music. Rabbi Yossi says, you know, even a good Yisrael is good enough. For even though this is a really a semi avodah of the Beis Hamikdash, nevertheless, it's good enough. And Rabbi Meir says, anyone is good enough, literally anyone, even Avodim. Can he play the flute? The only thing we ask for are his musical qualifications. If he has good musical qualifications, he's all right. What has all this got to do with the question whether the formal requirement of music is vocal 
or is it instrumental? The Gemara is now going to interpret this machlokus in terms of the machlokus as to whether ikashira bepeh or ikashira beklesia. Let's go and see it further. Now the Gemara says, let's go back to the page. My love, Baha Don't you think that the, the, the machlokus we're seeing over here and the three that I have on the sheet, on the, on the page, is essentially um, the machlokus that we, we were referring to before about what is the formal requirement of music. It will reflect itself in this machlokus on the page. How? The Gemara explains. Demand Omar Avodim Hayu, that Rabbi Meir here, who says even Avodim can be musicians, Kosoba Ikashira Bape. He probably holds that the Ikashira, that is the fundamental requirement for music, is vocal music. If that's the case, the, mu the instrumental music is just uh, an add-on. An add-on can be done by anyone. And therefore he says that even Avodim, even non-Jewish slaves can be the musicians because it's not a formal part of the Avodah because the Avodah really requires vocals. As long as the vocals are levium, everything else is fine. You can, you can choose anyone to be your flautist. That could be the reason Rabbi Meir says that even Avodim. And, and the Gemara goes on to say, Uman to Amal Levim, are you? This third opinion. The second one is going to be a problem. The, sec, the, the, the third opinion over here, who says that they have to be Levim, Kosova, he presumably holds Ikashira Bechli, that the main formal requirement of music in the Beis Hamikdash is instrumental. And if it's instrumental, clearly only the Levim are allowed to do it. The Levim are supposed to be the musicians. And if this is a formal part of the music, then only the Levim can fulfill that role. So all of a sudden, we've got, if you like, um, a like for like. Rabbi Meir holds that even Avodim, that must be because he holds that the fundamental musical requirement is vocal. And Rabbi Hanina, who says only Levites, he presumably holds that the fundamental requirement is musical and therefore only a lady is allowed to do it. The Gemara is very happy now with having, if you like, transposed the argument of Shira Bepeh or Shira Bechli into this argument of the identity of the, of, the, of, the, of the musical players. So let me just go on a bit because this, is, this, was, this was a suggestion that we may have now found a reflection of the argument, Ikashir Bechli, Ikashir Bepeh, in this machlokas here on the music, who, who is the musician? However, it doesn't work, as Admar will say. The Gemara is going to say, nice try, but it doesn't make sense. The Gemara now says, the Tisbara, do you really think you've solved the riddle? You know, that, that, that Rabbi Meir is like, like Pepeh and Rabbi Hanin is like Klishia, and you've proven the point, you haven't at all. Because there is a red, there is a sore thumb, and that's Rabbi Yossi, who goes for distinguished Yisraelim. What on earth is he saying over here? That? So it says the Gemara, e kasava, what, my kasava, Rabbi Yossi, my kasava. So what is Rabbi Yossi's underlying opinion? If you say he agrees with Rabbi Meir that Ikashira is my pair, that it has to be Ikashira is my pair, then why does he say you have to have a distinguished Israel? Why it could even be an undistinguished Israel? It could be anyone. In fact, it should even be Avodim. Once you hold like Rabbi Meir that it's not really a requirement to play music for Shira, only you only really need song then you shouldn't even need a distinguished Israeli. You could have any Israeli. He seems to be saying that's to be a distinguished Israeli. And Uman to Omar, uh, sorry, Afil Avodim, Ikasaba, Ikashir Bechli, if he holds, like Rabbi Hanina, that the real requirement is by instrument, then um, Levim en Yisraelim lo then he should not allow distinguished Yisraelim. He should only around like Levim. Essentially, the Gemara is saying, look, this question of Ikashir Befer, Ikashir Bekli, is, is, is on two poles. You either take one pole or the other. If you take Ikashir Bekli, that you have to have a good instrumentalist, that is what's required for the Avodah, then you will clearly hold only Levim. If you hold Ikashir Befer, which means the instruments are not really required, then you will clearly hold that anyone can do it. But now we've got this intermediate opinion, which is a pain in the neck for us.
because it doesn't follow the opinion of Ikashir Bepeh or Ikashir Bekli. And because of this, the Gomorrah does not like if, uh, conflating these two the way we've just done, because it leaves Rabbi Yossi in a position that you can't understand him. We could understand Rabbi Meir, we could understand Rabbi Hanina in the context of Ikashir Bekli, Ikashir Bepeh, but we can't understand where Rabbi Yossi fits into it. And therefore, the theory that we have seen over here, a reflection of an argument of Ikashir Bekli, Ikashir Bepeh, it, this doesn't, doesn't leave, leave us in a good place. The Gemara is going to answer, by the way, everyone holds the Ikashir Bepeh. Everyone holds that really um, the Ikashir Bepeh, that you don't really need um, instruments. That's coming next, perhaps we'll do it next week. You don't need instrumentation. And these three, and, and this is something you might have thought of right from the start. This is not meant to be a machlokas at all. Who says this was, there was an argument between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yusuf, Rabbi Hanina? Each of them, the Gemara is going to say, was um, telling over what they heard was the situation in the Beis Hamikdash. It's not their opinion. Rabbi Meir was brought up by his teacher hearing that the Ibn Avodim were the musicians. Rabbi Yossi was brought up, they only lived one generation or so after Korban Abayis, uh, that the Yisraelim, distinguished Yisraelim, were the uh, musicians. Rabbi Hanina had heard that only the Vim were the instrumentalists. It's not that they disagreed in principle on anything. This is a historical note in which Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yossi, Hanina have all come with different traditions as to the identity of the musical players. It doesn't suggest that they disagree on any matter of principle. The Gemara is going to say, in fact, on a matter of principle, they all agree you don't need anyone of any great value for the music because they all agree it's really the singing, the song, the vocalist that's necessary. But this Mach Locus is who was actually up there. And you can see that, you know, some, even if you don't really need musical instruments, uh, according to Rabbi Meir, in a sense, what we're saying is anybody goes. You don't need musical instruments. Rabbi Yossi is saying, I heard that only distinguished Yisraelim were up there. Not because they needed to be there. You could have had a vodim, but in the temple it's pasnished. You know, it doesn't look very nice to have a vodim up there blowing. So that presumably they, in, they uh, required the identity of these musicians to be distinguished Yisraelim. Not because it was anything to do with an Ikashir Bepeh, Ikashir Bepeh, Bekli. Just a preference. And Rabbi Hanina took it one further. And he said, well, I heard only Levim were there. Again, not because it needed Levim, because the, uh, the music didn't need Levim, could have had anyone. But again, Levim was singing. And, there, and you know, people associate music with the Levim so that, that we require them to be the musicians as well. But it doesn't actually show um, if this particular machlokas is not one based upon the question of whether Ikashir repair or Ikashira the Klee. So I'm going to stop sharing over here and um, I'm going to stop recording. One second.